Hey guys, welcome to the team. Hmm. We have Marshall, Anya, Kun with us, and also Huyi. Most of us would know Huyi already by now. So today, today's episode is sponsored by Coke. No, I'm just joking. We are not sponsored by Coke. <laughs> okay. So the topic that we are going to talk today would involve um, a lot of people's problems and also the solution, the possible solutions towards it. The first thing that we are going to speak about is the issue of long calls being delayed so much. Uh, or in, some, in certain cases, pupils have filed their papers in March and then they're only scheduled to get their long call, to be long called. Hello? Hmm. Is Vira breaking a bit or what? It's, it's frozen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see him from the yeah, he said his PC died. <laughs> I think I think I think alternatively to his uh, laptop, I think he might just connect wire phone, I think. Let me just tell him. Right. Actually, I think he already, he already went live with it, I think. So there's no way for us to stop it because we are not the host, you see. <laughs> Shit. Are we still live? Can people still we are, see us? We are still live. We are just waiting for him to come back early. But I think I think we can, we can um, while waiting for him, we can just start a little bit. Lah. I think like uh, yeah. continue from what he said, uh, he said some of the people are complaining that their long call date are way, way more later than what they are supposed to get. Is that right, Vera? Oh, yes. Apologies, just now my computer just been out of me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no worries, no worries. So, who, what do you think? What can be the possible possible solutions to this delay? Um, okay, uh, first and foremost, I am not sure how is the delay. I am not sure whether there's really a huge backlog of long calls. But I think court was closed for about um, a month or so, a month and a half. And there, of course, there are definitely people who probably were already waiting for their uh, admission uh, because of the MCO. They either they have been rescheduled or they have got a later date. So I think um, we have seen in recently in Singapore how they did it was via video conferencing. So basically, the so-called pupils will call in front of the camera and before like your, your video camera and the uh, judge is in his own chamber. So, um, I mean, that could be a way, but I don't foresee it happening in Malaysia. Because as far as I'm concerned, uh, yesterday, I think yesterday, uh, the court already started doing long call, at least in KL. So, uh, although there are some restrictions, I think they call in batches either five five pupils or ten pupils in one go, and the uh, long call speech is limited to three minutes, and uh, each pupil can only bring two guests into the courtroom. So, the has tried to impose some SOP and and to like clear the backlog up to and, and start admitting uh, uh people so I, I think that's a good move because um to me personally i don't think i want to be called in front of a computer uh it is um, a very important ceremony for um, yeah. for us and of course i will still want to be called in court 
and yeah and, and, and so to your question of course there are solutions you can do video conferencing uh, we have the proper system in place i believe the court can do it because you are already talking about online living and stuff but whether that's the way forward whether that's the way that pupils actually want it i do not think okay you agree with what yeah. essentially i mean if the court really start um doing long call back again i think it's fine i think it's just reduce the number of people getting called at one go so maybe instead of one session in the morning maybe split it into two or three sessions with smaller batch i think i think that's fine it's just just the court and the court staff and the guests that are attending it have to be i don't know everyone have to work together la, to make it work la. else it's just just not gonna happen I mean, I, I mean, like because personally, I transferred my call towards under my court, so L I transferred my call to my court. So, do you think it is a feasible solution for some to our people to actually transfer their long call to, for example, Seremban Hot Court or their hometown High Court? Then, do you think that would help reducing the number of long calls in KL and actually fastening the process together for everyone actually. What do you guys, what do you do? What do you guys do? Well, um, in a way, transferring to other state high court, it would definitely uh, speed up the process of long call. But if your long call date still fall within the CMCO period, which is until 9 June, then you still need to seek um, permission from the PDRM to do interstate travel, you see. If you don't get the permission, then your long call still delayed in the other high courts, you see. So if if they really want to transfer out the long call, I would suggest they transfer out the long call to the other state post 9 of June. Now. Then then I then I don't see the interstate permission being an issue. Lah. Okay. What what do you think, Huyi? I mean can can this interstate from interstate problem be I mean can, can it be an exemption for these people to actually get permission to be travel interstate? If they have this interstate permission, yeah. then yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I mean uh, whether or not you, you get the permission from police, I'm not sure because they have their own SOP, they have their own uh, criteria to assess whether you should be allowed to travel. But to me, um, the process to transfer your papers to another court in another state is a whole lot of trouble itself. I'm not sure whether it's worth doing it because you also have to understand in other states, they, uh, they don't do admission every week like KL. In other states, uh, as far as I'm concerned, for example, like smaller states uh, in police and all that, they just don't have enough pupils to be called every week. So they probably have like one ceremony a month, things like that. Um, so and because they ha have to wait for, say, when there are more people in Johor, I remember when I attended my friend's one, that was the only ceremony in probably that month and it was very hard for them to even get like more than 10 or 15 pupils so my friend actually had to wait because of that because they are not going to call the pupil uh, if they only have like one only one pupil so they, they they don't do that so i'm sure in other states when they don't have that many pupils in kl and Islamo, they they don't have like long calls every week so when you want to transfer your papers to another state i uh, highly doubt you actually speed up the process. I see, I see, I see. So, I mean, in terms of this, I've seen some pupils, uh, personally, some of my friends have gotten faster dates just by trying to ring up the PKP every day, which I'm not recommending people to do. <laughs> but I've seen it happen before. So, but then to be fair to them, they've also filed their papers quite early. So, I mean, moving forward for them, 
what would be the best solution to try and get caught as soon as possible if being caught as soon as possible is their priority maybe can they just wait out or just <laughs> well, disturb the pkp on a daily basis maybe well um out. yeah uh, if if i uh, take take example for um like my colleague um the people that is in my firm currently now um she filed a paper this week uh, i think on monday or tuesday she got a long call date all the way in 18 september so maybe maybe if you really want to consider to speed up the process if your long call is like four months or five months down the road then yeah uh, then i think you should transfer it out maybe to a closer state maybe ipo or even seremban where where then your guests can actually travel that or uh, <coughs> even for your fact that your master lah your master will be able at least travel down to Sermon or Ipoh. Mm. Then maybe you probably get a July date instead. Mm. I see, I see, I see. Okay, by the way, we have one question here from Rafiq Izzat. Hi, Izzat. Thanks for tuning in. Um, any takers for this question? Maybe Hui. The question is, hi, is that possible for the full instrument that is supposed to be paid at the disciplinary board CGL penampalan mm -hmm. and court to be transferred to pupil respective states as the inconvenience for us to travel. Uh, so I think what um, Rafiq is asking here is whether can we pay the instrument fee which is supposed to be paid at uh, disciplinary court. ASDB, yeah. uh, can we pay it at KL court? I mean, correct me if I'm interpreting the question wrongly. So, uh, CJ penampalan like KL court to be transferred to pupil respective states. I so, think I think what Rafiq's question is, uh, he is trying to ask: Is it possible that um, the payment for the DB and the uh, extraction of the CJ penampalan uh, for your borang six can it be done at their own respective state, um, as in like Ipo state bar or? um this seremban uh, no, negeri seremban state bar kind of thing i think that's what he asking instead of uh just at kl court because technically everything goes through rkk at kl court anyway yep yeah. but uh, as to as to my knowledge the the instrument fee at least for the time being can only be paid at level five of the disciplinary board if i'm not mistaken Right, uh, yep. and back right. then yeah. during my time, we pay it at level five of the disciplinary board, and so far I've not heard any exceptions to this kind of payment method yet. So the status quo, I believe, to answer that question still remains. We still have to go to disciplinary board to pay for the instrument fee. Yeah, correct. Yes. Yes, correct. Something to add on, Huyi, to this question. Um, the disciplinary board has moved to, for so KL, has moved to the uh, Wisma Badan Perguam where KL, KL Bar is uh, situated. Mm. So I paid it there. I am not sure whether you can pay in another state because your papers are technically not in other state bars. I'm not sure whether there will be any complication. So um, it is best to check with uh, the Malaysian bar or uh, KL bar, whether you can, if you are stuck in your hometown, how do you make payment? Yep. I believe if you call KL bar mm -hmm. as well, they might have another method of payment, but that can be confirmed with the Malaysian bar. I'm not sure whether they have made any exceptions this time around in light of the COVID-19 problem, but never hurts to try. <laughs> yep. <laughs> But that instead, yeah, I mean, can just give them a call and ask, lah. Yes, correct. Okay, so that's one question down. And Brent Foster here has said, "Is what a turbulent, turbulent time, which is it's a bad, it's a bad time to be alive, like <laughs> it's a bad time to be alive unless you are a producer or a hand sanitizer producer." So for us, it brings us all to the next issue that we're going to talk about some pupils have texted me saying that their masters have actually approached them 
to say that their allowance have to be reduced. So I'm not going to mention any names. It's just that a lot of uh, issues like this have been popping up. They have been saying that, oh, I can't afford to pay you 2,000 ringgit or 2,500 ringgit anymore. I'm going to have to cut it to half. If you can't accept that proposition, then we are going to have to stop your pupillage with us. So not all of us would have lucky. Not all of us would have been lucky enough to get good masters. So I'm just curious though. I mean, like, Hui, do you have any thoughts about these kind of issues? What what do the people have to do with this kind of situation? Um frankly, I think uh, everyone is in a very difficult time. Uh, uh, most of the firms are also struggling uh, to collect fees and, and to have new funds. So uh, honestly, I think we should feel very lucky that we still have the job. Uh, uh, it is yeah. kind of inevitable that uh, we'll have to take some pay cut uh, if if the bosses suggest us to do. But of course, um, people's situation is different from uh, the LA who are considered as employees when pupils are not. So uh, for example, as an employee, if my boss, uh, my boss cannot just cut my pay, he will have to discuss with me and if I agree, then only they will proceed to cut my pay. Um, but pupils, because you're not an employee, um, legally speaking, you are in a very disadvantaged position. Um, you don't have much bargaining power. Um, so, to me, the best thing that you can do is to uh, talk things out. You can only negotiate with your master um, uh, uh, to, to, tell, to tell him that. I mean, uh, first and foremost, you have to see whether it is reasonable. Right. Uh, for example, for example, if you are paid exceptionally well as a pupil, like say uh, four thousand, then now your boss say, "Oh, we now pay you three thousand or three thousand five. To me, it, it sounds reasonable, right? It is it, not saying that he's not paid completely, not paying you at all. So um, it depends on, of course, it depends on what commitment that you have. Um, so to me that's what you have to assess because ultimately you have nine months with your master uh, you have to think okay if i don't agree to the pay cut what is my what what's my option you either quit the firm find a new master um either you transfer your privilege with your master consent that you can go to a new master then you can continue uh, you don't have to start afresh or you just uh, 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 what we call withdraw your petition, then you start back. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether that's the smart move, uh, whether you really want to do that. Uh, you, you have to take into consideration for that. I mean, to me, pupillage uh, is not really about the pay, it is really about the learning experience. If you ask me, uh, if you tell me that because of the MCO, because of the COVID-19, my boss has zero file, he has not assigned me any tasks, there's no chance for me to go to court, there's no chance for me to draft anything at all, uh, then, okay, fine, you, you, you might want to um, uh, rethink, you might want to consider to change your master or things like that. Um, then that part I can understand. If you want to quit merely because of the pay, I I'm not sure. You know, if you if you still have a lot to learn in that case, you are still getting a lot of files. You will still have uh, many things to do in the firm in terms of like your legal work and uh, legal skills. A lot of things you can learn. You learn from a master, and the only issue is that you're getting a pay cut. I I, I don't think it's a wise choice to actually quit. Hmm. Yep. I, I actually agree. So the some some people have, have come come out with a quite a drastic uh what they call it a drastic solution of suing their master. So I told people to not to resort to this solution if if it's even a solution. And I'm not so sure whether Poon, do you agree with me? Um, yeah. Well, uh, 
Can they even sue their manager? Pay cut. Well, I mean, pay cut, pay cut doesn't seem like a a good grounds for you to sue your master. You see, I mean, after all, you just gonna chamber that for nine months for that same allowance that you're gonna say, and then probably cut maybe half a half of it at least, and then I I don't see how. Um, you would want to sue your master just because of a pay cut like that, uh. After all, um, if you want to wait out and then just complete your privilege and then just be gone and get get it over with and done with, lah. Uh, because this legal field is very small. <laughs> I mean, five years down the road, you might meet meet up your master as your opponent, and and because because of this issue of this, he might have just uh, I don't know, keep it in grudge and this and that. He probably just don't. Cooperate with you that much? Don't want to settle. Don't want to assist you. Uh, I things like that lah. I think all these meeting with things is just not worth it for you to chase until that bad that you really need to sue your master for it lah. That that's that's what I look at it lah. I mean, after all, allowances for pupils are really not um. It's not mandatory that uh the pupil master have to give. Actually, in fact. Um, there's no circular or rules that say that a master have to pay a certain fixed allowance to them. Uh, yeah. but I think I think both parties are both pupils and pupil master have to just sit down and discuss through negotiate how things sh- should be and how to mitigate something and then to gain something or to just if really wanna just end it any clean and this and that lah. Don't don't end it with some bad blurts and whatnot lah. That's how I think and look at it. Mm. Yep, yeah. I I totally agree with that. Uh, Hui, do you do you agree of this uh, solution? I mean, or perspective uh, with Poon? I mean, from Poon, by the way. Uh, I agree with Poon. Poon. I, I, I think the last thing that you want to do is to sue anybody. Actually, I mean, not just your master. Uh, you as a pupil, I'm sure you have. Uh, you have you have seen some court proceedings is definitely not the best way to resolve any problems uh, you know and, and like Kun said uh, do you really think it's a good idea to to still somebody who you know you might bump into next time yeah and, and, yeah. Uh, yeah the the circle is just just so small uh if you are going after somebody with um such a petty issue. I would think it's a, such a petty issue. Lah. Of course, if you're talking about more serious stuff, like, you know, sexual harassment and things like that, then, of course, yes, you, you should sue. You should sue that person. You should sue the master if he's done something wrong to you. But merely because of, like, uh, money, it, it, it seems a bit uh, unreasonable to do so. And, yeah, yeah. so that's my view. Correct, correct. There's always an avenue to actually reach out to the state bar and the Malaysian bar, but I believe at the end of the day, the most the state bar and Malaysian bar can do is probably to reach out to the masters and hopefully, you know, negotiate to come to a settlement or advice or, you know, talk to the masters to actually be, you know, more attentive or more reasonable in dealing with their pupils. But that at the end of the day, it boils down to negotiations, lah, right? So I mean, the like, pupils. In the end, you guys are adults. So if if this kind of matters arises, you have to think whether do you still want to work for this kind of master? Is the master actually being an asshole to me, or is he actually cutting my pay because he has to cut my pay? You know, right? So I think the best way forward is to negotiate. Maybe this month you can get a half pay. Maybe next month when the economy recovers, you can get more pay back again. But not just to cut off the tie straight away. I mean, at least yeah, that's what... Correct. Doing, right? Yeah, just yeah. don't jump the gun and then just abrupt up everything and then just... Yeah, everything yeah. just... Yeah, and bad blood then. Mm-hmm. Then you probably sit there in the next few days thinking, what, what have you done? If like if, if the instance where you end the thing um end with your pupil master in bad blood this and that, he or she might not sign your um transfer of privilege period form, you see. Then after the next thing you know, you have to start afresh again. Exactly. Correct. Yeah, that's just crazy. 
I mean, like pupils don't have much leveraging power, lah. To be honest with you guys, right? Yeah, I mean, not for that nine months, lah. Not for the nine months. Not we for don't that have nine months. Correct, yeah. correct. So we have a question from Rafiq again. From your experience, mm. experience of getting into employment, can you please share any tips on what to look first before accepting the job offer? Maybe uh, Hui, you can start by giving your opinion on this or answer. Yeah, um, I think before you accept the job, the moment when you want to apply, uh, you should have done enough research to to find out uh, as much as possible uh, anything regarding the firm and the bosses or the colleagues, the, the culture in the firm. Uh, to me, um, even before I uh, I applied for my privilege, I knew which area I wanted to go into. Uh, I know I, I, I am probably one of the few lucky ones that I, I, I did some internships and then I got some experience and I... I I could identify uh, whether I wanted a big firm, small firm, which area I wanted to do. So I was very lucky in that sense. So I applied. I only applied to the firm that I uh, that that do the practice area that I'm interested in. So just a general tip: uh, whether it's to apply to for privilege or LA position, first thing you have to you have to have the passion. Uh, for example, if you apply to a litigation firm, you need to be passionate about litigation because litigation is not is definitely not a nine to five job. Uh, it is more than that. Uh, if you do not have the passion, you cannot get through it. So you need to know um, what does the firm do. Obviously, what areas uh, do they only focus on, say, family law, or do they only do family law? If that's the case. Do you think you can do family cases for the not the rest of your life, but at least in the near future, can you do it on a daily basis, right? So that, that's the first thing, practice area. Um, secondly, the culture in the firm. How does it like? Um, uh, because to me, in whichever industry, whether legal industry, whether in the law firm or not, uh, it is always very important to fit into the culture. It can be a great firm. It can be a firm that pays you uh, 8000 per month as a first year LA. But if you, don't, if you don't fit into the culture, you cannot keep up with the, yeah. see the hectic uh, pace Pretty that much. the firm uh, uh, is, is, is doing, then I mm. think there's no point. You Eventually, you are going to be burned out. So you need to, I'm sure you know people, right? You, you are in some of the WhatsApp groups, Telegram groups. You will definitely, um, it is not so hard to find out who is uh, working in that firm. You can just go to the Malaysian bar and then type out, um, say, Vira and Co. Then you definitely know who, who is working there. Or, and you can just ask around uh, who has worked there. Uh, you can speak to that person or the some somebody else who have the experience uh, to ask them, oh, you've worked there. Uh, how is it like? What are the bosses like? Are they willing to teach? Do I get hands-on experience or do I uh, only do photocopying uh, jobs and things like that? And and yeah, and also you can ask them the most important question, oh, why did you quit? And do you know, what, what is the turnover rate? So to me, these are important questions. Of course, it is not the determining factor. These people quit, maybe they think they, they don't fit into the culture, right? It, it, you may be a good fit. So, but it will give you an indication why do people quit from that firm? Uh, how long do people act normally work in that firm? If it's like every three months, you hear somebody quit the firm, then uh, you should take the hint. Something is wrong somewhere. I don't know what. So yeah, you need to, that's the most important thing. You need to like the work, you need to like the culture. So before you apply, uh, before you talk about accepting the job, before going for the interview, the moment you put in your CV, because you need to do enough research to write a very strong and good covering letter. For example, uh, if I know Vera, Vera um, has a reputation of doing I, I don't know, uh, competition um, type of file, 
then I will want to cater or draft my covering letter to highlight that I'm interested in that area to get his attention. Because you need to understand um, as a boss or your HR, uh, HR department, they don't have time to read through all the covering letters and CV. You need to highlight, uh, you need to have some, uh, some wow factor in that one page to make them look further to give you an interview. So, mm. yeah, that's my view. I see. Okay, okay. Apun, anything to add on from, from that, Apun? Yeah, um, just a few more things to add on from that. Like, I mean, similar to Hui, I also, I also got um internship first. Then only I did my privilege and I'm still retained at the same firm. I mean, I'm at the same firm for almost four years. So it's a little bit um weird if someone asks me, uh, what do I look out for or any tips to get into a new employment? Because... Um, I wouldn't know because uh, the last time I've been in an interview was four years ago um, and I'm still at the same firm that I'm doing. Uh, it's just that I think during your interview, um, be honest with um, the interviewer. If the interviewer tell you or ask you something, uh, maybe question about your capabilities or your areas of practice of law that you wanted to or whatnot, just be honest. Don't just because you want to get that particular um, or secure that employment, you just um, just keep telling that you are more inclined to whatever their firm's practices. Like, uh, because I have some friends who just, when they were at the interview, they would just keep selling themselves up uh, and setting up their standards so high until the, um, the interviewer feels that, that they, are, they are just not being honest. So I think... During the interviewing, the, the moment or the period, that is that is very important as well. Just don't try oversell yourself uh, with unnecessary or unrealistic uh, standard upon yourself because if you can't achieve that standard, the next thing you know is that um, the partner or the boss that um, you're under with will notice that you are nothing but just just keep boosting and telling things. You can't if you can't perform what you are supposed to do, then you are very likely that you're gonna see yourself struggling a couple of months down the road. It will be only a matter of time before you quit or mm. your partner or the boss will just ask you to leave. Yeah, that's a that's yeah. from my point. Huh? Yeah, true. I, I just have a not, I have nothing much to say to add on before we move on to the final two questions. It's just that Rafiq, uh, I think everyone, at least at the time being, if there's any job offer, as long as the firm does not do anything illegal, uh, in, my, in my opinion, if the firm does not do anything illegal and the culture is not toxic there, you can still take the job offer at least yeah, for the time toxic. being. Yes, because it is not too easy to get any job offers, especially for pupils or lawyers, uh, starting out lawyers. Especially when you guys don't have, I mean, when people don't have much experience to begin with. So, as long as you guys are not forced to do anything illegal, in my opinion, the offer would be still be a good offer, at least in this in today's economy. That is just my opinion. So, moving on to the next question from Jesslyn. Yeah, Jesslyn's question is, is there anything we should take note of if the area we intend to practice after pupillage? is different from what we have done during pupillage. Okay, so uh, a, a note here. So all three of us so far, we have not faced this situation personally, at least for me and for Poon. Yeah. I don't think we have faced this personally. Even Huyi, I think, I uh, haven't faced this personally because Huyi has been with her, be her beloved master for quite a long time as well now. Right? <laughs> yeah. But is there anything you want to say uh, to answer this question? Um, I think um, no matter what, okay, okay. so wait, let me rephrase. Um, if you want to do something else, you should be uh, on a constant lookout for opportunities, learning opportunities at least. Uh, you need to equip yourself with the necessary knowledge. For example, uh, if I am uh, doing my pupillage 
in a commercial litigation firm, but I think I want to venture into family law. Then you will need to, I will have to study the family law on my own. It is not that hard. You know, I think for every area of law, it is not that hard to just pick up, pick up the statutes. Uh, family law, you need to be very well versed with your uh, Law Reform and Marriages Act. You need to know your Child Act, uh, Guardianship and Infants Act, things like that. You, If you have uh, interest in certain areas of law, I'm sure you know uh, what to read up. So if you intend to practice in another area after your privilege, you want to get a job elsewhere, you need to be able to convince your um, potential employer that I can do it, even though I've never done a single file in family law uh, during my privilege, I know a little bit of it and I'm willing to learn. So to me, uh, you, need to, you need to learn about the law on your own, uh, own effort. And of course, you can always ask other seniors. Uh, they will be very happy to take you with them uh, to observe the proceedings, for example. Um, so you need to be alert uh, about who are the so-called specialists in that area. Then you know where to ask for help or opinion when you finish your privilege. And of course, you don't. You can start applying for jobs um, uh, uh, even before you finish your privilege. So you need to constantly look out for opportunities and keep. Uh, improving your knowledge. Yeah. What about you, Poon? Anything to add on? Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, I think, I think. Um, for example, uh, maybe during privilege time, you, you are exposed to convincing practices. Uh, but after privilege, you feel that you just want to venture back in, or at least have some experience in litigation. So I think, I think what um what that person needs to do is if you if you feel that you want to practice a certain areas that you don't have opportunity to learn during your privilege then you should take more effort to learn up or to take notice of such kind of thing because if you you might not know that one day in your nine months of privilege just suddenly so happens that your pupil master just come and tell you that oh suddenly we have a file that uh it's regarding this certain particular thing and uh, that's the area of law practice that you want to do so then volunteer yourself to take up that file or at least assist the file for that matter and that's how you will learn from it um, if you really want to learn something don't shy uh, don't don't just keep quiet and don't tell anyone that you have interested you are interested to learn for that matter um, yeah just be bold uh, uh, if you just keep quiet, then you won't get the opportunity to learn things. So I think everyone should take initiative to at least volunteer themselves to learn more of that particular areas if you really want to do that after pupillage. Yeah. Um, I would like to add on something. I think when you yeah. have um, interest in certain areas of law, you can always tell your master. I'm sure they are happy to let you um to take in a file if they know you are you are of certain interest right or they can uh introduce you to their friends in the circle who who do that kind of file and you can tag along to learn so if you want to learn something you should always tell someone uh, then they can offer some help on your eyes. Okay, we'll move on to the second last question because there's also one question to WhatsApp just now. So yeah, uh, we'll just move on to this very quickly. Okay, Mr. Miss our Mr. Ao Yong here has asked this question. The boss mm. has revised the offer in respect of the pool, which something we have gone through just now. Do you think we should have, you should, we should have accepted the low pay offer, taking into account that there are many firms that stop hiring? So Kun, do you think you have something to say about it? Okay. Yeah, um, okay. If that means uh, essentially is that you got the letter of offer as probably LA, la, uh, LA position, uh, let's say 4,000, but because of this period, um, 
your bosses probably give a reduced pay cut or probably three or two thousand five for that matter. So I think, I think uh, it is up to a personal preference of that particular person. If you feel that that's the firm that you would see yourself continue working with, despite having a pay cut. Because you just love the working environment, you are you are well versed with the working system of that particular firm, and you feel that yes, there are there is a possibility that you might not get hired in this couple maybe two or three months or even, I mean worst case scenario all the way at the year end. So you have to weigh your commitment and to your ability to maybe reduce. Your spending, let's say if if day if monthly you spend sixty to seventy percent of your salary, maybe because of this period and the pay cut, you probably have to spend thirty to fifty percent only. So it it's a personal preference choice of that particular person lah. If you feel that you can take it, you can make it. Yeah. That's how I look at things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. Uh, what about you, Huyi? Maybe you can uh, give uh, one one a short question. Um, I, I, I mean, there's no yes or no answer to this. I would just say, um, if you want to quit a quit a job, you need to have a plan, especially during this very difficult time. Uh, if you are merely quitting because you're not happy with the pay. Uh, like I said earlier, I'm not sure whether that's a very smart move. If you still have a lot of learning opportunities, it is just because of this COVID-19, your firm is having some financial difficulty and they're asking you to take a pay, pay cut. Uh, I, I, personally, I probably would, would have stayed uh, unless, unless I have uh, some other plans. For example, I have already secured another job, or I already have planned to set up my own. So you need to you need to consider all that. Like I said earlier, um, money shouldn't be the only uh, factor that you consider when you accept an offer or when you quit a job. Okay, we move on to the another question uh, by Commander by Commander Zero here. What is your say advice? This politics and or all bullying pupils that happens during pupilage. Uh, maybe you can ask Taiko pun to answer this question pun. <laughs> how how am I Taiko when I'm I'm still younger than you? But I think um okay um I think there's two fold to this uh one is uh office politic and the other one is the pupils being bullied. So I will answer the office politic first. Um as for office politic if if you are caught in a situation where you have to pick a side um, and you are really torn apart whether you want to support your boss or you want to listen to your partner, um, that is actually very, very toxic uh, environment uh, that the firm is putting you in for you to, uh, to force you to make a choice between your boss or your partner. Or, or any maybe SLA or even LA for that matter. But um, office politics, if you can avoid it, you avoid it. Uh, try not to participate in it. Um, but if you are really stuck in it um, and you really have to choose a side, uh, choose the lesser evil. Uh, um, people will say uh, you might be selfish for just choosing the winning side, but uh, it's really up to that person. Uh, if you, you just want to secure yourself, just, just stick with the winning side. Uh, but that also means that you are, you are a little bit lalang la because you move here, move there, depending on which side is the winning. Um, I think that's about it. Office politics I, I don't, I have no experience to say that further because um, my firm is very small. There's only five of us, so technically there's no office politics. Um, <laughs> maybe the only office politics that I get is uh choosing between uh, to support my boss or to support um, the account manager, which is my boss wife. So if they fight, then I have no way to really sustain myself. So that's a body of office politics. 
um, on the pupils getting bullied, I believe that um, it's wrong to bully a pupil. But at the same time, um, I mean, because time has changed, uh, certain people uh, or younger generation wouldn't wouldn't have experienced the same thing that how the older generation has experienced. So uh, maybe back then, uh, 10 or 20 years back then, it, this kind of thing is not bullying. But now, um, at the look looks of it, it is a bullying. So I think what the pupil ought to do is um, you can actually voice out. There are few channels that you can tell. You can refer yourself to the pupils' committee of each respective state. Uh, reach out to probably your senior LA or even your partner or bosses that that you can seek a solution from or at least a some certain redress from. Um, that is for the pupils getting bullied. Uh, for the people, uh, for the person who actually committed all this bullying, I think no point you bully uh, a slightly inferior party or person in your firm, you see. It's not going to make you uh, any better or any higher position than anyone else. It's just that, yeah, you feel good after bullying that particular pupil, but end of the day, uh, you still need them to do your binding of your document, to prepare your uh, submission or to do certain things that you need help. I mean, you got to appreciate the help of the pupil at a certain time. You, you, yeah. can't just, you can't just disown all their credits and their effort to help the firm or that particular LA or SLA. Yeah. That, that's my thing. Okay. okay. So we move, uh, Hu Yi, maybe you have something to add on uh, before we comment. Um, office politics actually i i disagree with phone um i think even with two people three people in the office you can still have office politics <laughs> so uh but i i agree that um you should try to stay out of it but um as a pupil because um you probably only have nine months there you want uh, you want no trouble in the firm so mm. if I would you, I would try to stay out of it, but I, I also understand that there are times uh, it is just inevitable. Uh, you will just be dragged into that whatever fight that they are having. So um, you can speak your mind uh, because you, as an adult, you can tell uh, what is right and what is wrong, right? Uh, as long as you are not like hurting anybody, I think you, you should voice out because um i mean this leads to my, the the next part uh bullying to me when you don't speak up for yourself you give a chance uh for the bullies to actually uh, bully you right if they know you take a stance they know you know how to protect yourself um they are most likely uh not going to come near you right that's my understanding um, and next, bullying pupils. Um, so it, it, it again, it comes down to what kind of bullying you're talking about, whether throwing all the files to you or uh, something more serious like um, sexual harassment and things like that. If it is sexual harassment, uh, sexual assault, and all that, you should definitely uh, report to the authorities because you you have your internal HR department uh, and and you can tell them and they should offer help. If they don't, you definitely need to seek help uh, elsewhere. If you are talking about in terms of say like workload, they always give you a lot of work. They give you last minute work. They give you a lot of uh, transcribing to do, a lot of translation to do because you hate those kind of work. They purposely give it to you. If you view that as bullying, I would advise you to uh, look at it in another perspective. Don't look at it in a negative way. You can, you should look at it, at least that's for me. I would think that, okay, la, never mind. I have one more file. That person has one less file, which means I have one more learning opportunity. That person just thrown away. He has just thrown away his learning of his or her learning opportunity. That's how I will look at it, and I I will always remind myself that I I know there are there are times where you just have a lot of work. You are just very grumpy. You just don't want to do it. But 
somebody just decide to throw the ball at you and probably it has happened many, many times and you get very fed up. But again, um, uh, this is, I would say this is adulting. Like, this, you can't run away from it. Again, you either quit the firm or you, uh, the word would be suck it up and do it. So to me, if the work is there, I would always try to take it as a positive uh, learning opportunity. Yeah. True. Correct. I, I agree with Hui and also I also agree with uh, certain points that I've put and mentioned. I mean, like, I'm not sure whether I'm a bully myself. You have to ask the ex pupils in my ex firm <laughs> whether I'm a bully or not. <laughs> but the thing oh, is. Yeah, that definitely, we have to ask her. <laughs> but the point is, I think if this case happens, if it's really bullying in a serious manner, for example, sexual harassment, like we have mentioned, please do not be afraid to reach out to people. You can reach out to any one of us. You can reach out to me, you can reach out to Poon, you can reach out to Hui. Yi. You know, you, you can reach out to anyone, doesn't matter. There's pupil support group, there's brainy law, if any, you can just, you know, text us and we can try to, try our best to deal with the matter. Some, we cannot solve everyone's problem, but we can try to do our best on how to help you the matter. So it actually, we have actually exceeded our time. There's still two more questions. I think we'll just quickly answer it. So for yeah. Luke, he, he has asked us just, I joined a litigation conference in November and five CPD points are granted. However, I didn't receive any cert from the event. How do I know if I collected the points safely? Thank you. You can uh, email to the CPD department. They will let mm. you know. If you, I mean, if you're a pupil, because you, as a pupil, you don't have a BC account. But if you are a lawyer, you will have a BC account and you can access to the portal and you'll find out how much points you have collected. As, as a pupil, um, you can always email to CPD account. Uh, email address, you just Google it. Yes. I totally, yeah. I, I totally agree with you. That's, that's the solution. And sometimes conferences, I'm not so sure about the conference that you have attended, but not all conferences actually grant a physical cert. Sometimes they just give us a C5 CPD points and that's about it. But to be sure, you can ask your organizer. I'm not so sure about which organizer is this, but you can always ask your organizer where is the physical cert, if any. And thankfully, Raj here has also pointed out correctly, for pupil in chambers, you may email the request to check the CPD mm. points that you have obtained during the pupillage to the CPD department. Shout out to Raj. Thank you for the, thank you for the info. And we know that Raj has been the, also has been the like halo for the pupil. <laughs> we have, he's also the KL Bar uh, Pupils Committee Chair. Thank you for tuning in, Raj. And that comes to the, clo the closing session of this uh, event. We have one question left in WhatsApp. Maybe I can read it. It's in Malay, actually. Okay, so, then we are actually in Malay. Uh, Wira, kalau saya tak falkan borang satu saya pada hari pertama cimbring saya, saya falkan pada hari esok, boleh ke? Saya affirm pada hari, contoh saya affirm pada 1 Januari, Tapi saya hanya falkan pada 2 Januari. Adakah, adakah itu tepat? Okay, so I, I will, saya akan answer, uh, jawab soalan ini. Eh. Uh, Farah, tak mengapa. Kalau satu hari saja beza, biasanya tak apa. Kalau, tapi kalau paling afdal, kita falkan pada hari yang sama. Ianya akan jadi satu masalah kalaulah uh, Farah falkan uh, borang satu tu seminggu kemudian ataupun dua minggu kemudian. Uh, itu akan menjadi satu masalah. Kalau Farah hanya falkan pada satu uh, satu hari lambat uh, on the day of starting pupilage, tidak menjadi masalah. Cuma the, the date uh, of starting pupilage tu biasanya akan start pada the date of filing. Okay, on the date of filing. Tetapi uh, secara praktikalnya lah, orang biasa kalau dia tengok tarikh dia borang satu tu adalah tarikh uh, bila kita start pupilage. So maksudnya kalau falkan, kalau tarikh pada borang satu tu adalah satu hari bulan Januari dan kita falkan pada dua Januari, biasanya lah kita akan consider 
kita filekan pada saat uh, start to play on 1 Januari walaupun kurang tepat sebenarnya this is one of the loopholes in the system currently because we don't have, I mean RKKK doesn't have the ability or to check when did you uh, actually affirm the thing and when you e-file sometimes sorry Malaysian bar so Malaysian bar will not know will not be able to know unless they check with RKKK when you file your uh, borang satu so this this is something that you have to be uh, careful about paling afdal filekan pada tarikh yang sama kita start you publish tu saja yep okay so i think that's the end of the session today there's no more question for today uh, if like if there's any more questions we are always uh, reachable at our people support group if we all know hui you can always reach out to hui we also know pun they always text pun or you can email us you can reach out reach out to us on facebook there's always there's something uh, some avenue for you to reach out to lah so thank you for tuning in guys if there's any more questions just blast us at our via <laughs> whatsapp or facebook yeah okay. this session <laughs> okay ciao guys Take care and stay safe. Right. Bye. Yeah.